a very, very uh, odd uh, story. It happened to 12 years ago. And I participated uh, in a talk show, uh, trying desperately to promote my first book. And it was this kind of talk show when you get a politician, a writer, and a transvestite. <laughs> and uh, I, it was my, I think, one of maybe the first talk show I ever participated. I was completely stunned. I didn't say a word. I was the writer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So then there was a commercial break after I hadn't <laughs> said a word, and the politician, the minister in Israel's uh, government, he leans to me and he said, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, I, I, I'm a writer, I wrote a book. So he says, you're a writer, you know who should you read? And I was sure that he was going to say Agnon or uh, Herzl or Amos Oz, and, and he says, Ian McEwen. And he, and, he, and he shows me in his suitcase, he's reading Enduring Love. So I was, you know, it is Amnon Rubinstein is the name of the minister. He was minister of uh, commerce and, and once minister of education. I was so shocked by the fact that minister is reading fine literature. I immediately went to buy the book. And since then I'm, I'm, I'm following your writing and, and enjoying it very much. Um, there was a, a translation of the first pages of Solar in Haaretz, the newspaper. And one sentence caught my eye, and I will, I will, it's a translation from the Hebrew, the Hebrew translation, uh, so it will probably not be exact, <coughs> but it said, no one should say that in this late stage of his life, he is immune to new experiences. And in Hebrew, Al Yomar Ish, Shibeshalav Meuchar Zeshel Chayav, Uchasim Ifne Chavayot Chadashit. So when I read this, I thought uh, uh, about this new experience that you're having this week, this Israel experience, and, and I wanted to ask you the first question: Is are you, or were you immune to it, uh, and how did you find this week? Well, it's been very intense, of course. Uh, very nice actually to be here to talk about film rather than um, politics or literature. But I have to say that um, it was a struggle. Um, a lot of pressure on me not to come here. Um, extremely glad that I, I did come uh, to engage and to learn and to um, meet Israeli writers and um, engage with people you know, um, across a whole range of uh, opinion uh, from your mayor on the one side right through to friends at um, Sheikh Jarrah the other week. Um, a real sense of democracy of opinion here. Um, so, um, no, it has been an extraordinary week. And um, the sentence you quote is a man who the new experience referred to here is suddenly finding that the, his fifth wife is having an affair with the builder. <laughs> uh, that's not the kind of fresh experience I was looking for. <laughs> but it has been. Um, <coughs> it has been quite a jolt, actually. I'm, I worry. I just started a novel before I left, and I think when I get back, it will look somehow irrelevant. I'll wait to see. This one, one of the things I wanted to ask you is this shift. I, I find it uh, overwhelming, the shift between the solitude of writing, this room you're in for a long time, and, and then suddenly you're... You, you're public uh, figure and you are an opinionated public figure and you talk and you meet with people, the shift, how, how can you do this shift or are, are you, did you get used to it during time? I always live with that shift, in fact, that's really one of the reasons I started writing screenplays, um, to break the solitude of, of, of novel writing. The very first screenplay I wrote was for television. Uh, Mike Newell, actually. Uh, there was a little opportunity to make half hour movies for BBC television. And um, I discovered the heady, delicious feeling of no longer working for myself, no longer being God, but just being a, like a, um, the lowest angel. <laughs> but it was for television, and the great relief of television is, is it is a writer-centered medium. So we made a little thing, uh, shot in the studios in Birmingham, 
Um, and it gave me the taste for the, how wonderful it would be to alternate the solitude of writing, uh, not with the busyness of um, promoting books, um, but with the intensity of filmmaking and that rather heady sense of controlled panic, um, that sense of $100,000 or $50,000 a day is leaking away, um, which enforces on people generally, unless things go badly wrong, a kind of competence. And I love other people's expertise. I love carpenters who can knock up something at great speed or electricians who can improvise something around some expediency. Um, in fact, my second experience was with Mike Newell again. Uh, and I had the even more delightful experience of making a, another TV film with him, which instantly got banned. Um, it was an adaptation of one of my short stories in the 70s. And we rehearsed it, we designed it, it was all ready to go. And at the last minute, the uh, hierarchy pulled the plug on us. Why? Uh, obscenity. Um, the, there was a scene in the movie where uh, a man had inherited um, from his great-grandfather uh, a, a penis pickled in a jar. Mm -hmm. And um, during a row with his wife, she picks it up and um, throws it at the wall. And it was a, it would have been a good scene. <laughs> and, uh, and we had, as you would all know, uh, we had six such penises. Um, and I went back uh, the day we knew that we couldn't shoot film and all the money was taken away from us. I went back to go and get one and they've all gone. You know. <laughs> on six desks around Britain, <laughs> but not mine. Yeah. Also sense this demand for, for truth, and, and what do you think that the, the mm. role of fiction and plot in it? Well, I think the novel had its roots in this. I mean, I think this is just a return to something that happened in the early 18th century, um, when we think of um, prototype English novel like Robinson Crusoe, based very much on a real journey, uh, or Swift's uh, Gulliver's Travels, which is also a kind of extension of a very popular form. And many, many 18th century novels begin you know, in the town of you know, one letter and a dash, in the year uh, 1750 something. In other words, writers were always playing from the very beginning with that sense, this is real. I wouldn't, I mean, I think memoirs are, are a very interesting form, but they all are tinged with useful lies and with um, the structuring of um, narrative to make to make sense of the past. So I, I don't feel any pressure about that. I, I know that the, the country that has, has really experienced this, in, uh, as well as here, of course, as you explained, is France, um, where the biographical novel has become a, a major force. But no, it doesn't touch me. I, I think um, my business is to invent. Uh, I've never wanted to write a memoir. I want to read uh, a short piece out of Saturday. Uh, have you ever heard uh, your uh, book in Hebrew? Uh, not knowingly. <laughs> <laughs> OK. It's the first time. Uh, it's a beautiful piece uh, regarding music, uh, which I sense is a big love of yours. So I'm going to read the piece in Hebrew and then ask you about, uh, about music. Uh, the hero of Saturday is a brain surgeon, and he goes to hear uh, music played by his son. And it's, it's a beautiful piece about music and about what I think art can do uh, to life. Henry שעייפותו פגה, ניתק מן הקיר שעליו נסמך עד כה ופוסע אל מרכז העולם החשוך, אל עבר מנוע הצלילים הגדול, ומניח לצלילים לאפוף אותו. אלה הרגעים הנדירים שמוזיקאים נוגעים יחד במשהו מתוק יותר ממה שמצאו אי פעם עד כה בחזרות או בהופעות, משהו שהוא מעבר לשיתופי בלבד או למיומנות הטכנית. כשמבעם נהיה נינוח או מלא חן כמו ידידות או אהבה, באותה שעה הם מעניקים לנו הצצה אל מה שאנחנו יכולים להיות. 
אל העצמי הטוב ביותר שלנו, ואל עולם בלתי אפשרי שבו אתה נותן כל מה שיש לך לאחרים, אבל לא מאבד שום דבר משלך. בעולם האמיתי יש תוכניות מפורטות, פרויקטים עתירי חזון למען ממלכות שוחרות שלום, יישוב כל הסכסוכים, עושר לכל בני האדם, לעולם ועד, חזיונות תעתועים שאנשים מוכנים להרוג ולהרג למענם. ממלכת ישו עלי אדמות, גן העדן של הפועלים, המדינה האסלאמית האידיאלית. אבל רק במוזיקה, ורק לעתים נדירות. המסך עולה ומגלה את חלום השיתוף הזה, והחלום מופיע כמתעתע <coughs> קודם שהוא נגוז ומתפוגג עם אחרוני הצלילים. I think it's a beautiful piece and I want to ask you about, about music. Do you write with music? Are you inspired by music? I could never write with music because I like it too much. Uh, I'm one of these people who likes music so much he's always asking waiters to turn down the music uh, in restaurants. But I don't like it as background. I like it as foreground. If you want to have a conversation, you don't want, or if you want to write a novel, you don't want the music in second place. I've always been passionate about music. It, it, I don't really think it has any effect on my fiction at all, except every now and then I have a character who's involved with it, loves it, um, talks about it in the way that one would talk about anything in life. You know. um, in Saturday, I'm particularly interested in utopias, and uh, Isaiah Berlin warned us against people who want to force utopias upon people. Uh, they can be very dangerous because if they're rational, they make the calculation that if they have found the way to make everybody happy forever, then killing 10 million people to get there is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, in music, you can fleetingly, only fleetingly, get just that touch of paradise. And I, I used to sing in a choir Uh, sometimes when I listen to choirs or watch orchestras, uh, and as in that, even if it's ragged, if it's school children playing, or I get the sense of <coughs> perfect human community. But perfect because it's so fleeting. I don't, know what, I don't know what a world would be like in which everybody was always content. We wouldn't be making movies, I don't think. We wouldn't be writing novels if we were. boundlessly content. There's always that itch of things not being quite how you want them. But it's that little friction that's necessary to, to turn us into filmmakers or novelists or screenwriters. Yeah. Talking about Saturday, uh, reading it, I thought there's something almost Israeli in this book because it talks about this uh, a, a slow process in which public life or public <coughs> or a, a violent surrounding osmosis into private lives. So this is, uh, I'll rephrase it as a question. Uh, I think one of the dilemmas writers in Israel or filmmakers have, and, and also students of ours, is whether they would write a story or tell a story which could have happened anywhere, could happen in Norway, or Is, is in kind of a bulb, a psychological bulb, or are they, or will they address the situation around them, what is happening around them? If you, if you go to uh, the Saint Spiegel final night, uh, uh, when, you, when you see the movies after people finish their studies here, you can see this dilemma, you can see people who decided to, to address the situation around them, you can see people that, that made movies that are that could, uh, uh, properly made in, in, in Great Britain. So, Do you, do you, and in your writing, I, I, I sense that you, are, you have books that are in a bulb and books that are totally engaged with contemporary issues and, and historical. I think you just have to be free. I mean, I, my feeling about all novel writing, and I guess this would apply to filmmaking, that all the best, um, all, all the best novels are regional. They're local, they're provincial. All the great novels, whether it's Madame Bovary, perfect novel of French provincial life, or Anna Karenina, or Middlemarch, whatever you care to choose, are specific to time and place and to uh, an immediacy. And that's why I would say that if you're a filmmaker or a novelist here, you sh should feel free. There isn't only one situation here. I mean, the, 
there are people falling in and out of love and getting ill and recovering or not and all these dramas that, that happen anywhere else in the world but it needs that I think it needs that local flavor you cannot there is for example you find it in any airport an international style of furniture and it's a terrible style of furniture. you want to give whatever you do <coughs> the flavor of who you are and what, what there is around you that doesn't mean that I think that every Israeli novelist should be writing about you know the Arab Israeli situation but I think it needs that sense of local flavor I'm very interested. I mean, I, I hope we have some time for some questions because one of the things that I've always maintained, I just want to talk about screenplays for, for a bit, um, is that um, I've always been interested in the connection between the screenplay and the novella. And reading a little about the Sam Spiegel School, I, I read that there's quite a commitment here to strong narrative in filmmaking, uh, which interests me a lot. Um, that the demands of the novella, and I've, I've written four or five of them, are uh, very close in length and in conception to the demands of a screenplay. And if you think of a screenplay as about 20,000 words, they, they generally, you know, if, you, if you do that lovely thing of make sure your screenplay ends on a page 108 um, and not on page 198, uh, you would have maybe somewhere between 18 and 25,000 words, which is the perfect length of, of the classical novella of Death in Venice or The Half Darkness. Um, or that uh, little novel that I referred to uh, by uh, Yet yeah, Essie uh, yeah. yeah. um, I can never pronounce it, Kibbet Kitsi. <laughs> yes, I can never do that, <laughs> but I'll work on it. Um, with a wonderful cast, with Anthony Hopkins and Isabella Rossellini, a uh, marvellous American actor called Campbell Scott. Uh, all the ingredients were right, uh, and yet um, I think I got tired of rewriting the screenplay. Schlesinger wanted endless rewrites. He was the second director, so that meant you know, there was a history of writing this thing. And I thought, I'm never going to do my own novel again. Uh, but I've always made myself an executive producer, so at least I've had a veto on the director, uh, and I have been able to see all the stages of draft. But you know how it is, the nearer you get to the thing taking off, um, the closer you come to the fact that the only one person is going to take control the convention is it's the director uh, and I ex also accept the convention that I can give these notes but just I have to accept whether they're taken or not so that's that's been my level involvement and um, I tend to see some stages of um, rough cut to fine cut I quite like that uh, I'll repeat that in case people behind you didn't hear uh, it's, it's a very perceptive question in fact, uh, about Chesil Beach, uh, there is a, uh, a hint that the, uh, the young woman has been abused by her father. Uh, and I won't give you the whole plot for those who haven't read the uh, novel. And it's true that in earlier stages of draft, it was very explicit. And one or two of my close friends who read the novel uh, gave me a note on this. And it's one of those notes that as soon as you hear it, you know it's right. I didn't struggle with this. They said this creates a kind of determinism for the whole of her behavior, whereas actually we want many things to be part of her behavior. So I took it all out, and that, so that didn't work, and so I fed tiny bits of it back in. In the movie, um, well, Sam Mendes said, well, as soon as we cut to a, a boat, which is where this thing happens, we know we're going to be asking ourselves, why are we on a boat? So what I've done it all with music. Um, I have them say her sailing with her father. It's a 11-year-old girl who's abused by her father. It seems strange to say this because it's not actually in the novel in so many words. And I just have her lying. So the boat is in a harbour, 
it's just across the channel to France. There's um, <coughs> just a one shot of her in a bunk bed, and she is listening on the radio. So she's going to be a classical violinist when she grows up. She's listening on the radio, fiddling with a dial, uh, a Rachmaninoff piece for two pianos called Symphonic Dances. A very beautiful, lilting, simple melody. And she looks up and down at the, the ladder, back lit, is the shadow of her father coming down the steps. And that's all you ever see. Years later, she's at a concert turning pages for a famous pianist uh, for this piece. And just, we'll have to, it's a great demand, it'll be Carrie Mulligan. The camera will just be on her and the music will, she'll be going through a memory that is very, very stressful. That's all you will know. So we won't see anything beyond this connection. And at other points of stress, this music will float back in. Will come. But I think since this is partly a novel about music, I want it to be a film about music. And the problem is that many directors, you suddenly find yourself the director who hates classical music. So when I interviewed directors for this, I would ask them innocently, you know, often on our way down the stairs, do they like classical music? And if they said no, I'm afraid they. They were off my list of <laughs> possibilities. Because uh, I know what then happens. Um, they hire a composer in to write Mozart-like music. Mm -hmm. And it's often a kind of kitsch version of when you can have the, the real thing for free. You know, no PRS, no copyright. You know, it's there. Use it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is difficult. Right? She's asking about atonement and about the fact that... Uh, <laughs> The narrator is very close to uh, the conscience of, of a woman. And she's asking, how does a man write a woman? And, 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 and I'm adding, do you really think it's, it's more difficult for a man to write a woman in these days than to write a man? Well, I've met some women. <laughs> um, and it isn't really the task of the novel to inhabit another mind and, um, uh, so it seems to me you know we are creatures who are um, instinctively capable of a, an amazing transaction um, socially and privately with others uh, of not only seeing from every word and gesture that someone makes, uh, seeing a sense of another consciousness, but also getting back what they're making of you. And it's, it, you know, I know what you know, that I know that you know that I know, maybe three times, four times even. It's called a theory of mind. I mean, anyone who's studied any um, cognitive psychology will know it's a, a very strong idea in, in child development. Children begin to get a sense of of another mind uh, about the age of four, and it gets more and more complex. And the novel, I think, is an extension of our innate capability of seeing ourselves read back and, and reading others. So uh, I think all social experience teaches us a sense of being another person. And um, men can write women as well as uh, women can write men. I don't I think it's um, very, I remember Faye Weldon, an English novelist, once said famously, and I think she's lived to regret it all her life, she's always being asked about this, that men shouldn't write women and women shouldn't write men. I mean, the logical consequence of this is that you'd only write about yourself. You know. Can a young man write about an old man? Um, can, um, the only question a reader need ask is, has he, stroke she, done it well? I mean, the, that's, the, that's the whole other matter. Um, it was interesting, <coughs> too, uh, just coming back to atonement. One of the best moves that Joe Wright, the director, made was to cast uh, Saoirse Ronan, who at the time was 11 years old, um, the central role in this, uh, this movie. 
um, she was a little girl who completely sort of, she hadn't read the novel she wasn't allowed to read the novel because it has some explicit sex scenes in it uh, and yet she just sort of got it and she completely it's one of those cases where one person holds the set together and it was a child um, a very knowing but charming and uh, sweet, tender consciousness. Um, and I, when people say, well, now I've seen the movie, it's gone and replaced and displaced you know, all the characters that I had in my head from reading the book, I have to say with atonement, if I think of atonement, I now see Saoirse and it's happened to me now. She has stolen my heroine, uh, but agreeably um, and beneficially. Um, an amazing face that's not quite pretty. Um, in other words, not a movie face, but a real sense of a, a child, slightly priggish, slightly self-opinionated. Uh, also, she, you will not know this from the movie, but she had the thickest Irish accent you've ever heard. She comes from Dublin. And she could, just like that, then adopt this upper-class, clipped English voice of the, of the 1930s. Um, and now, of course, she's, you know, she's been in The Lovely Bones, and you know, I think she's got a, a big future. In the beginning, so I, I just wonder what you... Yeah, well, actually, you, you, you've touched on a... Look, this is about, really, movement in time, in novels and, and, in, and in movies. Uh, we had arguments about this, because in the novel, um, Robbie being arrested is the end of part one of 66,000 word one day thing and as I saw it it needed something really symphonic and big um, I wanted the car to go away from the camera into a mist uh, then I wanted us to dissolve through that mist and, and we had by accident uh, a marvellous shot um, from a cherry picker of three soldiers in including our principal, making their way through a field of poppies. And I thought, that is, that is where you need to begin. And the director, and this is the problem with directors, <laughs> they hate doing something if it's too obvious. So he wanted to start right in the middle of the scene. So if you were in a farmhouse, you don't know where it is, people are coming up the stairs, there's no tension. Um, that scene actually, I kept saying to him, we don't care about these guys yet. We don't know who they are, so we can't be anxious with them yet. And anyway, you've cut right into the middle of, you know, there's quite a lot in that farmhouse scene, which you just, uh, it's the fear, and I find this, say, with opera directors too, uh, the fear of doing something simply because it's logical, so they have to fight against it. It's this sort of concept-driven notion that you mustn't go down that road. And I, uh, so I lost that battle, of course. Um, and so we don't get a real sense of transition in time. But I, I, I disagree with you on, 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 the, on the general point. I think movies can cut through time very well, generally. And I, I do think it's possible to do. We don't need the wavy lines anymore or whatever. It's called. But I mean, you, can, you can move forwards. And an audience is now very sophisticated. The grammar of film has taught us almost we hardly are aware of it. That we we know when we've leapt forward five or ten years, or or even backwards, and we don't need to know straight away necessarily. Mm. And now prosthetics is amazing. I mean, you don't need three actors. Or you, you can do it with extraordinary uh, stuff. In um, when we made the Innocent, uh, John Schlesinger insisted that the young man who was Campbell Scott was probably an actor of about 30 playing, his, playing a character who's 30 and then many years later he comes back to um, Berlin as the Berlin Wall is coming down and he's meant to be a man in you know 65 or something <coughs> and he said I don't want him looking too old because nobody likes old people on the screen <laughs> well uh, it meant it was completely implausible 30-year-old guy with a little grey moustache. You know, just, it, was, it was gone. 
nowadays we could spray that face with all kinds of you know horrible actors hated of course but, um, they had to get up so early to be in the, <coughs> in the makeup but uh, it's brilliant now in the researchers specifically uh, a wonderful piece of, of uh, description of a squash game in Saturday I'm a squash player also and I kept on wondering did you research that or are you a squash player and if you can elaborate uh, on research in general well no I didn't need to do any research I played squash all my life I've now stopped uh, I stopped about four or five years ago, um, and I moved over to tennis. You cannot play social squash. Um, you can't say to your opponent, uh, let's just knock it around. Uh, squash is to the death, and that's why I stopped. I thought, I'm going to die on this court, because um, I, I get so excited by it. it it's so gladiatorial. Um, <coughs> And there's only two, nobody watches really, um, or certainly no one ever watched a game I played in, because um, I'm never good enough. Uh, research generally, for me in fiction, uh, is seamless and inseparable from, from the writing itself. I don't do the research and then write the book. I, I set up on this journey and along the way I do the research. So I wrote a novel about a Saturday that you quoted from about a brain surgeon a neurosurgeon and I found a friendly neurosurgeon and for the two years that I was writing the novel I was shadowing him around and eventually then started to stand at his elbow as he performed operations uh, it was delicious I loved it because I would go with him and we'd put on these um, scrubs and uh, I bet it's the same here. So green scrubs, and the men wear V-neck scrubs, and all the surgeons make sure their chest hair just sort of curls. Up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, whenever I walked down the corridor, I felt like everyone thought everyone who didn't know me thought I was a brain surgeon. <laughs> and I felt this is delicious. It's so important. Um, it was that was my most intense. He kept saying, well, what do you want? And I, I, at the beginning, I couldn't tell him. But by uh, the end of two years, I, I had almost all the novel written. And I say, well, actually, what I want is a, a very big trauma to the head. Not, not I don't want it personally. <laughs> uh, and I want to see a procedure where you... Um, rescue a skull that's been really badly smashed and, and so we did you know he did that I have to say we did that he did that um, I got so involved I remember once I was um, he, he was very good at doing what's called clipping an aneurysm um, when a blood vessel in your brain the side walls of it burst it's, it's very very dangerous because blood then fills the, uh, the whole cavity of your head and because there's nowhere for it to go, it starts putting a colossal pressure on the brain. Um, and he was performing this, I'd watched it many times, and I was standing back a bit, and two students came in, fifth year medical students, and they, they came up to me and said, uh, excuse us doctor, do you mind if we watch? And I said, no, fine, go. <laughs> and then they said, uh, well, would you mind telling us um, what's going on? And I said, yes, come over to the light box. And there were all the CT scans. And I said, well, this is the problem. And we're taking the classic route. And I, I thought, I've got to try this out. And I gave them a 15-minute lecture on uh, the process and what we, would, we were doing. And at the end of it, they, they said, oh, thank you very much, doctor. And I said, good luck in your finals. And I, always wonder if they just if they passed their final and they knew that they were getting instruction from a novelist not, not a book. they were very sweet and attentive anyway that was my biggest immersion ever the room is, is full of the young people um, doing their first steps in their creative uh, career uh, wondering what it would be like and, and I 
wanted to ask if you had to, to give them one advice regarding being creative, writing, doing films, what would you say? Well, I'm usually asked this question about writing and my answer is always the same and I think this will make a lot of sense to the Sam Spiegel School, which is begin with short stories. So clearly um, you have this commitment to short movies here. You don't just see them as um, things that are on the way to something else, but it's a form in itself. And uh, that interests me a great deal. That there is this, I mean, clearly there are budgetary reasons for making short movies, but there's something else too. Um, the great uh, advantage of writing short stories as a beginning writer is you can afford to fail. For three or four weeks you can write the worst short story in the world. It won't actually screw your life up very much. I know that actually the analogy begins to crumble a bit because to make a short movie is more than three or four weeks and it's a, you know, a much bigger commitment. But making short things and uh, delighting in imitating the, the masters uh, and then discarding them seems to me the, one of the pleasures of, of starting out. And I certainly spent a lot of my time writing short fiction that was pure pastiche of writers I like. Again, I know that you can't quite have the luxury of making endless short movies that are pastiches of Truffaut or whatever. Um, but still, the five or ten or fifteen minute movie that seems is the, is the brilliant laboratory in which you can forge your talent and I do wish you all luck with it. <laughs>